presence of my enemy. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. It's I raise a hallelujah.
there's a song inside of you and he says let it out let it out there's a song inside of you he says let it out let it out oh cause no one else can see your song no no one else can see your song you got to wait for Yeah. 
creation there at the start before the beginning of time with no point of reference you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light and as you speak a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath the planets fall if the stars were made to worship so will I I can see your heart and Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. See your void. For once you have spoken on nature and signs, follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures. Just catch your breath Evolving in pursuit of what you've said If it all reveals your nature so alive I can see your heart in everything you say Every pain in sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. So. So will I If the mountains bow in reverence So will I If the oceans roll your greatness So will I For if everything exists to lift you high If the wind goes where you send so will I If the rocks cry out in silence So will I If the sum of all our praises still fall shy Worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes way. Send it so will I If the rocks cry out in silence so will I If the sum of all our praises still fall shy Then we'll sing 
If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praise is still for shy, then we'll sing again a hundred billion times.
That's right, God, you do great things. God, you do great things. Right now, let's close our eyes and lift up our hands. Let's just worship Him, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's right, just open up your hearts today. We just want to worship you. We just want to worship you. Sing this together. I'm letting go of every distraction. I still my mind, quiet my heart. I'm listening now. I'm giving you all my devotion. And I'm making room for you to move Here I am now Jesus Jesus When you walk into the room All I want to do is worship you Now then you're here I see your glory breaking through The space between us There's nothing holding me back I'm coming back to where I started something new come fill me now I need you right here in this moment there's something more to what I've known speak to me now there's something more to what I've known speak to me
Let's lift up our hand. Here and now, in this place, open my eyes to know your mystery. Here we are, face to face. There's nothing between us that separates. in your presence that's right today God we say we want to go in deeper than never before the Lord take us into your heart today so I stretch out your arms let's reach to God it's closer than the air we breathe Hallelujah. Sing from the top. Here I stand before you now As honestly as I know how Broken by the days gone by Spirit help my soul to rise I try my best, but still I fail And even then you're with me there You remind me I'm a child of God Regardless of the things I've done All my hope is found in perfect love your mercy triumphs over judgment love wider than horizons stronger than all sin and Lord your us to repent it to the heart of God your heart of oh God is all I Well, 
to say that it's impossible to ever say that a sin is so. But my God says to the prodigal, Oh, my beloved one, you're welcome home. Oh.
So, our Lord, we say that you are all we want. Right here and right now, in your presence, we lay down every crown. We lay down our pride. We lay down our gifts, our talents, and we come before you just as you are. So, receive us, O oh Lord, into your heart today. Lord, your heart is a tender place, a place of rest, of comfort, a place of peace, a place where, Lord, we find strength in you, a place that where we, we mountain on eagle's wings, and we rise above everything in this world. So today, Lord. As we worship you, as we exalt your name, this is what we bring: everything of us, everything that we have and we are. We bring it before you. We offer it as a living sacrifice. We thank you, O God. Bless our time today, O Father, with your sweet, sweet presence. And in the name of Jesus. All God's people say, "Amen, Amen, Hallelujah." Let's give Him a big hand. Hallelujah, God, we praise You. That's right, You are worthy, 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 worthy. Hallelujah. That's right. We thank You, God. Thank You, God. I hope you enjoyed the praise and worship as much as I did. We prepared something special for you, so get ready. I've been thinking, what does it mean to be the church? Not the space you fill out with pews and a choir, or just a group of people gathered to exchange smiles and house your days before parting for Sunday brunch. What does it mean to be a living, breathing, moving community? Earth humans of the flesh trying to navigate the darkness of the world, and still preserve, amplify God's goodness, like salt. To cure meat. I was just thinking the other day that to be a servant of Christ is to represent the greatest paradoxes in life that even our heads sometimes can't fathom. To push down fear and say God is still good to the unconverted, to dismiss cynicism and bring hope, to cast aside judgment and tell them you are still loved, to let the scales fall from our eyes and be a reminder. Sometimes our vision gets clouded by the seeming responsibility of being a good Christian, or by the stubbornness of needing to accept change or to be one. Truth be told, we are not one to cast any stones. He came to save the last, the lost, and the least. We wouldn't have come to know him if we were otherwise. Pitches of water. Cannot provide for thirst until water is poured out from them. It doesn't matter if we're filled with living water, if we have not quenched. Our relationship with Christ, like streams of water, hopes to reach from the highest to the lowest of places. A town on a hill cannot be hidden, 
A lighted lamp is never placed under a bowl. If this life is marked by one thing alone, I hope it is marked by how you have shown yourself to them through us, and this light shall never burn out. It was never about tireless devotion now, was it? It's about influence. It's about who and what you represent. When the day has closed its eyes, and we have soothed the wounds from when our best was still not enough, as we lay down our burdens, the expectations we've been reaching, the guilt we've been chasing, the images we've been portraying, when we leave all these in the shadows and step into your light, who are we? Who are we? What does it mean to be the church? How good was the video? Such a good script too. Well, here we are. Welcome to Represent Jan Conference 2021. I would love to think that all of you tuning in online is excited for the message tonight, what God wants to speak to us as a community through it and through conference this year. I'm so pumped for the lineups for the rest of the conference. I'm praying that through the different sessions, we will experience God so intimately. And how good was the canvas art opener by Jung Han, who painted an art piece about Peter taking a step of faith to walk on water. And what a beautiful worship. Thank you, team, for ushering heaven in. Thank you, Malcolm, Sean, Faith, Melvin, and Ben for leading us in a beautiful time of worship earlier. This year, it's pretty much simpler. We don't have Zoom workshops because of the theme this year, but stay tuned for post-conference because this year we won conference to be spread out across the remaining months of 2021 because it's a huge theme to really dive in, dissect, and talk about in just two days. So stay tuned. Well, I'm honestly really excited for the rest of the lineups because we are going to start day two of conference with cross-visations. If you're wondering what cross-vision is, in a nutshell, it's having conversations centered around Christ. This year's cross-vision, seven of my amazing mates are going to be sharing from their heart and experiences on how to represent God authentically and represent Jesus in the pillar of society God has placed them in. And of course, David, founder of Encounter God Now, great mate of mine too, will be hosting the conversation. Then we have Isaac sharing out the word at session three in the evening. Isaac has really been an encourager to me, an older brother, even though we only reconnected last year ever since we met in 2013 in a singing competition. I know, wild times. And my favourite segment of conference is the five plays encounter. Always ending conference with worship. And what's interesting this year is that the Fireplace Collective will be leading worship in the Fireplace Encounter session. Some of Jen writers came together with the Fireplace to write originals and we'll be singing them tomorrow night. I'm excited, really, really excited and also really grateful for the teams that work so hard. Months and months of preparation, sweat and tears and sleepless nights and the grace and the strength of God finally led us here this weekend. Well, if you're excited, drop some excitement in the live chat and our amazing host team will be more than happy to engage you and we will pray. Father, we just thank you for tonight. Lord, as we step into your word, God, I pray that you speak through me. Lord, may your words be my words. And God, I pray that the words that are coming out from my mouth will be anointed by your presence, that it will speak to the hearts of the people. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. The gospel of Christ is the message of love. True capital L, love. Hashtag love wins. 
1 John 4 verse 7 to 17 says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world that we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, verse 11, since God loved us so much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and His love is brought to full expression in us. Verse 13, and God has given us His Spirit as proof that we live in Him and Him in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent His Son to be the Saviour of the world. And verse 15, all who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them and they lived in God. And we know how much God loves us. And, he, and we have put our trust in in His love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. Verse 17, and as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face Him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Some version says, as He is, so are we. As Jesus is, so are we. The gospel of Christ is a message of love, true love, capital L, love. The Bible did not say that God is the God of love. Neither did the Word of God say that God represents love. But God said in the earlier passage that we just read that He is love. The title of my message tonight is Stand Up, Stand Down, Stand Out. Stand up, stand down, stand out. It's a message that's close to my heart and a message that I've been thinking about, researching about, meditating about, and even trying to live out because I want to practice what I preach. When I felt the Lord, Lord's prompting to start this community, I asked Him for a plan or else I wouldn't have embarked on what we're currently doing you know, Gen Conference. Because to me, it is a God-sized vision. It's a huge responsibility. It's scary. I didn't, feel, I didn't feel adequate enough to take it on. But guess what? God did give me and a team a five-year plan. And this is the five-year plan. I am called to represent the kingdom and to represent the gospel in a creative way for people to experience Jesus, the way He wants us to experience the Father. The five-year plan is, I'm called to represent the kingdom and to represent the gospel in a creative way for people to experience Jesus the way He wants us to experience the Father. This is Jen's five-year plan and what's after, I really don't know. I'll leave it to God the Father. You know, in May 2019, Joy and I started Jan as a worship conference in Surabaya, Indonesia. The conference was called I Am, where the theme is centered around knowing our identity in Christ. Then after I Am conference in 2019 to 2020, the core team and I felt the Lord was leading us to go deeper, to do something more than just a conference. And last year, we had a virtual conference and it was called The Call, you know, and it was about understanding our true calling in life through knowing that we are made in His image. And the conference was also newly introduced as a gathering, an annual gathering of believers and worshippers. This year, Jen is pretty much more set in stone with the vision and the direction God wants us to head towards. It's also pretty apt that the theme for conference this year is called represent. There is a double-edged sword meaning 
to it. With wordplay, adding a hyphen after the letters RE, the word represent is pronounced as represent. When COVID hit us in 2020, I've heard and seen so many more stories about how the Christian community, the church, has caused so much pain and disappointment in many people. And some, I've, you know, some of the friends that I know personally have left the faith. I've also experienced it, the pain, the disappointment. And I started to wonder about when we say that the gospel is powerful, when we say that the Word of God transforms lives, why are people repelling from the church? Why do, we, why do people turn, turn down our invitations, have second thoughts the moment we invite them to church? If we were created to be attracted to beautiful things, why then are people not attracted to what believers like us believe the gospel is powerful, life transforming, and what we believe the church is, the house of God, a safe space, a community? One of the key reasons I could think of is that we probably misrepresented Jesus and the kingdom of God while trying to live out the life the God way. I know of friends who never wanted to step into church because they fell into sin. And the first thing, you know, they did after they, they, they fell into, they, they, they fell, you know, um, is that they want to run away from the church instead of running to the church community. In recent months, I've discovered even more do better church movements. I've been in conversations about why the local churches should do better because of the hurt and pain that people experience, people experience. And I can understand, of course, not fully, why these movements have risen. And going back to why the theme of conference this year is so apt, is because when COVID hit the world in 2020 and caused us to enter into this global pandemic, this season that we are in has caused us to slow down, to travel less, to think more because we were all stuck at home. I mean, some of us are still in lockdown. With more time to process things and our emotions and our thoughts, people started dealing with deeply rooted issues, shame, hurt and disappointments that were never dealt with, that were swept under the carpet for years, that were overlooked and excused for years. This year, the conference is about learning as a community how to represent God authentically and how to represent Christ effectively in the here and now. What I'm saying here tonight is that as we as followers of Christ, we as believers of Christ should strive to, you know, we should strive to become more and more like Jesus every day. And because we live like Jesus here in this world, then we will be, we represent the Father, His heart, His kingdom authentically and re represent Christ who is the same yesterday, today and forever effectively here on earth, here in our communities, here in our families, here in our workplaces, here in our schools. But what I will not talk about is how we should do church, the mistakes we've done, we've done in the past, because we won't get it right all the time. We're, we're, we're learning. There's so much to learn, unlearn, relearn daily. And also, because the Bible says, we always have to refer to the Word of God. It says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if anything is is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Represent. How do we represent the Father authentically and how do we represent Christ effectively? Aren't God the Father and God the Son one? They are. They are one in nature, the Father, the Son and Holy Spirit, but there are three in persons. They function differently in the Trinity. God the Father shows us that in the same way parents might create and nurture life, He cares about His creation. 
and wants to protect it. He created the universe he loves and he is the provider for them. Ultimately, God is the creator of all life. Whereas God the Son help us, helps us to understand how God the Father makes His love known to us here and here in this world. Jesus taught compassion and healed the sick, opened blind eyes and freed captives. The life of Jesus, as described in the Gospels, also demonstrates that sacrifice and suffering are important parts of the human experience. God the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the idea of God's only presence. He is always, always, always present in the world. It is a source of strength strength to believers as they feel God with them always. This is a little theology on Trinity. One in nature, but three in persons. So how do we represent God authentically and represent Christ effectively? To represent God authentically, we must know the heart of God. It's the second song, second worship song we sang just now. You know, to the heart of God is all I want. And the key to know the heart of God is to imitate Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Christ said in, one, in John 14, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. God gave Jesus to us that we may know Him so that our relationship with the Father is restored, so that our relationship with the Father is reconciled. So when Jesus came to earth, He gave us the framework of how to live. He presented us with the model and told us exactly what He was doing. He was showing us who the Father is through Him and what the new kingdom that is coming will be. He taught us about the great commandment, which is to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and to love our neighbours as ourselves. Jesus also said that He came to bring good news to the poor, to restore sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. He praised the peacemakers, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are merciful and those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. He told many stories. Jesus told many stories and taught taught parables that demonstrated how we should live in right relationship with God and with one another. He gave us a framework. So our responsibility as followers, believers, in the here and now is to create our lives and live them out according to the framework Jesus laid out. And my personal, re- personal revelation of the framework is the title of my message tonight. Stand up, stand down, stand out. Stand up. We all know what standing up for something is, don't we? We stand up for something that we want done right. We stand up for something we believe in. We stand up for something we're passionate about. We stand up for moral rights, right morals. Basically, when we stand up for something, it's because we want to protect and defend the cause. We want to protect and defend because we care for it. In Matthew 21, verse 12 to 13, it is a scene where we see Jesus standing up for something by flipping tables in the temple. This is Jesus we're talking about. You know, in verse 12, it says, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Mark 11, verse 15 to 16, we see a slightly more elaborated perspective of how Jesus responded at the temple. Verse 15, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus 
entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. People are not wrong for saying that Jesus was fired up and unapologetic about displaying a holy anger to prevent people from being taken advantage of in the name of God. Jesus was standing up for what should be done the God way. The reason the imagery in this passage is so powerful is the exact same reason it shouldn't be a default excuse for calling people out angrily because the action contributes to cancel culture. This term cancel culture is not something new. It's, it's more talked about these days. And the thing that we do, you know, calling people out angrily is really not what the kingdom culture is. It does not represent the Father authentically. And something important to keep in mind, you know, Jesus flipping tables isn't to excuse us for standing up for what we believe in or are passionate about, by being defensive or simply overly divisive and ungracious, be it in conversations or on social media. It isn't Christ-like, even if you quote the story of Jesus at the temple. If we are not careful with how we stand up and defend something like the faith, we carry a self-righteous spirit. This kind, the kind of behaviour Jesus displayed in temple that afternoon isn't by any means disallowed, but it wasn't exactly a daily part of Jesus' life either. Jesus' ministry involved little leshing and flipping tables. The reason his actions at the temple was effective was only because it was reserved for an extreme situation. The story of Jesus cleansing the temple teaches us that we are allowed to be angry, to stand up for what's right. But the life of Jesus teaches us, more importantly, anger is the exception because love is the standard. Love is the standard. Let's go back to Matthew 21, verse 12 to 13 again. And this time round, one verse after verse 13, verse 14 says, The blind and the lame came to him and at the temple and he healed them. In verse 12 and 13, you see Jesus flipping tables and one verse later at the same temple, after overturning tables, Jesus immediately ministered to the people there. We see this also in Mark 11, verse 17 to 18. It says here, and as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd, listen to this, was amazed at his teaching. As Jesus flipped tables, he taught. He was teaching the people how to honor God's house and his people, as we can see, the guy selling doves and the money changers obviously ignored the needs of the people when it was visible to them, when it was in reach, within reach. That angered Jesus. The whole idea of standing up isn't about, hey, look at me, I know more than you. Or mate, what, what are you doing? It's so wrong. Just look at me, understand it, of how Christians should behave. No, Christ is the standard of how Christians should behave. We are to imitate Him. And the moment we carry self-righteous spirit, we're not imitating Christ because meekness and humility are what Jesus is, what He carries. Let's take, let, let's take things closer to home. We all know that social media has allowed people to engage in ways no one could have predicted. The platform's ability like, um, is meant for good, to connect the world and maintain relationships. But it also carries very specific risks. Digitize interactions. Typed out words, you know, on our phones we type words with no face-to-face interactions has stripped the humanity out of authentic communications. Confrontation will stop being uncomfortable and start being entertaining. We see this so often now. 
provoking a strong reaction starts becoming a rare occurrence for rare situations. It is now a standard part of dialogue. Loving your online neighbours and enemies stops looking so loving. Taking out a whip, flipping tables becomes a norm in society. These contributes not to the kingdom culture, but to cancer culture. If this is how we stand up for our faith or for whatever things we believe in, by taking offence, by being defensive and divisive and ungracious, we stop being known for our love and start being known for our anger. And that's not how we were instructed to live according to the framework Jesus laid out. The story of Jesus cleansing the temple will remain powerful because it's an example of how we should reserve this kind of action for rare occurrences of extreme, of extreme injustice, not making it part of our daily lives. It should be so exceptional when we display this kind of anger, people notice that love, that love, that love is the standard. And our lives should not be defined by our anger, no matter how righteous it is. Anger is the exception because love is a standard. We stand up and defend, not stand up and divide. Amen. The second part of the framework is stand down. John 8, 1 Verse, uh, John 8, verse 1 to 11, it says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand, wow, before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. But Jesus bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. And then when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stood down on the ground and wrote something. At this time, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, he said. she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now, leave your life of sin. Or, you know, some version says, go now and sin no more. In this story, Jesus was pretty passive, right? With his response, unlike how he aggressively responded at the temple where he overturned tables. He didn't say much, just time or do much. The Pharisees was the one that taunted Jesus for a response but he ignored them. He stood down. The definition of stand down is to withdraw from a contest, a position of leadership, or relax from a state of alert or readiness. You often hear these two words, stand down, stand down, in movies about armies or SWAT teams. In a scene where the commander wants his team to cease fire or withdraw from an action, the commander will command, command his team to stand down. Stand down is an action that is literally the direct opposite of what stand up means. Are you interested to find out why Jesus stand down? You know, oftentimes in Jesus' public ministry, he was challenged by religious leaders. Their questions were meant as traps. It was not their desire of wanting to know God's heart. The Pharisees' act of placing the adulterous woman in the midst of the crowd is part of the intended drama the drama queens, by them. This was meant to be as public as possible so that Jesus' response is publicly made known. You know, if we do understand the context in those times, we read earlier, in the law of Moses, adulterers had to be stoned. 
The Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus into a choice between mercy and justice. So if Jesus were to have mercy on the woman by arguing against a stoning, then he would be seen as unjust and therefore unrighteous. On the other hand, if Jesus were to agree with the law and allow them to stone the, the woman, he would be seen as unmerciful with wisdom. Jesus Jesus' response was to keep the demands of both justice and mercy. He didn't respond by speaking against the law or agreeing with it. Instead, he put it back on the woman's accusers by saying, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And after everyone has dispersed, Jesus told the woman her sins are forgiveness are, are forgiven and instructed her to sin no more. Jesus restored the adulterous woman privately. It was his kindness that led her to repentance. The story reminds me of situations I've been in where I've been taunted to gossip. Many Christians are always trying to cancel someone out there just because we don't live up to the Christian standard. When we're part of that kind of conversation where we get into a discussion on on how someone's lifestyle should meet the Christian standards, we actually, yes, we actually have condemned that person. These conversations are traps. We may excuse ourselves in the name of, I'm helping this person. But in actual fact, we are already cancelling this person. We have judged them and cancelled them out. We will be seen as unmerciful. And if we don't engage ourselves in this conversation, you know, the other spectrum, you know, people, the Christians will always, you know, see you as someone who is unrighteous because we may come across as someone who do not want to address and correct wrong behaviours. But listen, if we were to imitate Christ, standing down isn't asking you to cower, like to be a coward or to ignore but rather living out Galatians 6 verse 1. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, if if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should, what? Gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Not cancel them out. Not call their mistakes out. Be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So in the story of the adultery, Even though Jesus alone had the moral authority to stone a woman for her sin, Jesus instead stood down and chose forgiveness. He chose redemption. The last time I checked, Jesus knew the teachings of God. He came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But he did it through love. Because what? Love is. Is the standard. The greatest of these is love. Jesus came to represent the Father and to represent Him. Remember the framework that Jesus laid out. God the Son laid out the framework to help us understand how God the Father makes His love known to us here and here in this world. So even though Jesus alone had the moral authority to stone us for our sins. He didn't do it. He's here to save the sinners, not condemn them. Jesus came to save the sinners, not to condemn them. Our response, our response should always be love. Love is a standard, whether we're standing up for something or standing down. When our response is to stand up, love should be the standard. When our response is to stand down, love should be the standard. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 to 3 says, we all know this verse. It's, 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 it's something that we always go to talking about the concept, not concept, but the, the love of God. It says here, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. I am nothing. If I, have, if I give all 
You know, my possession to the poor, to give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Everything we do without love is vanity. Why? Because, because love is a standard. We're down to the third and final part of the framework of Jesus. I hope you guys are learning something tonight. The framework of Jesus. That is whether we respond by standing up or standing down, we will always stand out because love is the standard. Love is the standard. He didn't, God didn't say like it's the standard. Love is the standard. It's easy to love someone when we like them. But how many of you find it extremely difficult to love someone we don't like, that we don't agree, don't agree with? Luke 6, 32, the 35 says, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked because love, love is the standard. Love is, is the standard. And that's the heart of God. When our love is our standard, we will stand out. When love, sorry, is our standard, we will stand out. Because our response, whether standing up or standing down, when love is our standard, we exuberate the heart of God. We exuberate the heart of the Father. That's how we represent God authentically. And we re- represent, we will represent Christ, our neighbours, when we love them. I mean, tonight we're talking about both representing God authentically and representing Christ effectively. When we represent Christ to the world, when we demonstrate, we, we represent Christ to the world when we demonstrate God's love to the rejects. We represent Christ to the world when we act as peacemakers in this world that is filled with, with violence and hatred. This is the framework. This is the framework Jesus laid out. He presented the demonstration of how we must live, bringing God colours into the world. And now, it is up to us. It is up to us as a community of believers to represent that demonstration when we stand up or stand down. When we represent that demonstration, we are actually representing God the Father, His heart, His kingdom authentically. You know the song says, break my heart for what breaks yours. What? What breaks God's heart should break ours too. What breaks God's heart should break ours too. Let's stand up, stand down, and stand out the way that represents the Father authentically and represent Christ effectively. We need to. We need to. For the prodigals to come home. I feel like the Lord in this season is doing something. It's it's a homecoming season where the prodigals one by one, step by step, come home. Come home for hurts to heal. We need to represent God authentically and represent Christ effectively for needs to be met, for the broken to be mended. They need to experience the heart of God. 
to represent the Father authentically, to represent Christ effectively, I know it's not easy. It's not an easy responsibility. But the last time I checked, God is not looking. God is not looking for a perfect person. He's looking to perfect His people, to usher heaven down on earth, to imitate Christ and, and, and to live like Jesus in this world. So is as He is, so are we. As He is, so are we. And tonight we're going to sing this song. It's called Upper Room. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit into this room tonight and wherever you are tuning in to, to, to the, the conference tonight. Let's invite Holy Spirit to help us to represent the Father to help us to represent Christ. Let's invite the Holy Spirit in so that we can become more and more like Jesus. That's our goal as believers. Thank You, Lord. Come and fill this room tonight. Come on, wherever you are, just lift up your hands as in an act of surrender. You know, open up your hearts and invite the Holy Spirit into your room, wherever you are, your living room, your bedroom. Wherever you are, whichever city you are in, whichever country you are in. We're gonna sing this song. Help me, Holy Ghost. I need you more than anything Oh, my best ideas are yours What am I for what you make of me? Can we sing it again? Help me, Holy Ghost you more than anything Oh my best ideas are yours What am I for what you make of me So help me God Breathe on my weakness for all I one is to be like Jesus. I don't have much, but what I have is yours to use. So make my whole life your upper room. Come make me your upper room, God. As we wait on you Ooh. Come on, we sing Help me, Holy Ghost I need you more than I can say May your thoughts become my own Till the Father's will in me come on we sing it out so help me God so help me God breathe on my weakness for all I want is to be like Jesus I don't have much but what I have is yours to you Your upper room, Jesus. I'm waiting on you tonight, God. Help me, God. Breathe on my weakness. Oh, Jesus.
sing it out Your mercy, your mercy Triumphs over judgment I'm wider than horizons Stronger than all sin Lord, your kindness, Lord, your kindness leads us to repentance to the heart of God. Your heart, oh God. Is all I want is God. Is all I want. Is all I want. You're all I want. Come on, let's sing it out with faith. You're all I want. Come on. Declare it tonight wherever you are. You're all I want. Jesus, you are. You're all I want. Yes, I do. Yes, we do, God. You're all I want. God, this is the cry. This is the cry of our hearts tonight, God. This conference, God, is an offering. It's an offering, God. It's a platform where we wanna build the altar, a worship altar. And this year, the theme is represent. And tonight, God, we want to pray this prayer. The cry of our hearts is to represent you, the Father, authentically and represent Christ effectively in the here and now because the prodigals need to come home. Hurts need to be healed. Needs need to be met. The broken need to be mended. The oppressed needs to be set free tonight. Jesus, the name above all names, you're worthy to be praised. Oh, Jesus, you're all alive. Our time is gone, but If there's anything that I feel like the Lord is saying tonight and you maybe you didn't catch whatever else that I shared, it's not about me, but but I feel like tonight if God, if there's something that you wanna take home and, and bring that and have it sown into your heart and your life, that is love. Love is standard. Love is the standard because it exuberates the heart of God. And that's how we're gonna authentically represent the Father and effectively represent Christ. So let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for tonight. What a presence. Thank you, God. Couldn't, we, could, we, can't, we can't do this without you. 
without your presence, without you, without your anointing. God, these are just songs. These are just another public speaking message. But because your presence is anointing every word we sing, every word we speak, every chord we play, every um, frame uh, scene that we were capturing. You know, everything that we do, God, if with your presence, there is power. So Lord, we thank You. Who are we that You're mindful of us, that You call us friend? And so tonight, God, we offer, we offer our worship to You. That this is our heart's cry. We wanna represent You authentically and we wanna represent Christ effectively. So Father, we thank You. We thank You for Your presence. We thank You for what You're about to do and what You have done tonight. And I pray, Lord Jesus, come and have Your way. We're gonna make room. We're gonna make room for You to move in every session. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, let's give God a big hand. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you for joining us at our opening session of Gen Conference. We pray the message tonight will champion you to represent God authentically and represent Christ effectively. Rest up and we will see you tomorrow at 1 p.m.
Sing a little louder. Oh, won't you sing a little? 